Thank you, Dr. Righteous, and thank you everybody for joining me today for our Lunch and Learn. Today we'll talk about how seatbelts and bike helmets can save lives. I'll go over some real life case examples to stress the importance of using both. Uh, and then I will teach you how you can save a life uh, by identifying and stopping life-threatening bleeding in an emergency situation. So let's get started with seatbelts. Motor vehicle crashes are the leading cause of death in those aged 5 through 34. Seat belts reduce injuries that are serious and they also reduce deaths by 50%. Airbags, although they are helpful and provide added protection, they are not a substitute for seat belts. Buckling up is the single most effective thing that you can do in the event of a car accident. Lap belts and shoulder belts are important. They're secured across the pelvis and the rib cage, which are better able to withstand crash forces than other parts of the body. You can see here on the right in figure A, this is an appropriately positioned lap belt as well as shoulder belt. And then in figure B, you see the highlighted areas. Those are the parts of the body that receive the majority of the force when uh, you have your seatbelt on. So let's talk a little bit about seatbelt history. So seatbelts were actually invented in the early 1800s, but it wasn't until 1885 that the first safety belt patent was issued. And this was actually issued to a New Yorker who wanted to protect his tourists in the taxi cabs. So he developed a simple lap strap. In the 1950s, there was a Swedish safety engineer who worked for Volvo, who developed the standard three-point safety belt that we know today. And in 1959, the first car produced with the standard three-point safety belt was first rolled off the production line. Interestingly, in the interest of safety, Volvo actually made this an open patent. So it was free uh, to all car manufacturers in order to um, promote this three-point safety restraint in other uh, vehicle types. By 1968, all new American vehicles were required to have this three-point safety. However, 14 years later, in 1982, a na nationwide study showed that only 11% of people were actually using their seatbelts regularly. Two years later, New York then passed the first mandatory seatbelt law. And by 1996, every state, except for New Hampshire, had a mandatory seatbelt use. And as of February of this year, New Hampshire is in the works of uh, passing their own bill that would require all adult drivers and passengers to wear seatbelts as well. Seatbelts save lives. 14,955 lives were saved in 2017 alone. In 2019, our national usage rate was much better than in the 1980s, almost 91%. And while 91% seems like a great number for how many people are using their seatbelts, when you hear that 2,549 additional lives could have been saved, we obviously could do better. Everyone should buckle up every time. So I wanna move on to my first case example. And while these are all real life scenarios that I've encountered in practice, I've changed details of the uh, injuries and as well as the details surrounding the accident in order to protect patient privacy. And any pictures and images that I show, they're representative of these injuries themselves. So this first patient was a 22 year old male. He was a driver and he was not wearing his seatbelt. He was traveling highway speeds when he lost control and hit a tree. When paramedics first arrived, they found significant front end damage to the vehicle, and the patient was in the vehicle, but unresponsive. So he required intubation and required full life support at the scene. They evaluated the scene, and they noted that the patient had a laceration or a big cut on his forehead, and then he had a starring of his windshield, which is seen in this picture here on the right. Other than that, there is no other external signs of trauma. So this patient was brought in as a level one trauma activation. Now a level one trauma activation is the highest level of trauma and that indicates this patient likely has life or limb threatening injuries that need emergent intervention. So a level one trauma activation will mobilize the entire trauma team, the operating room will be notified as well as the blood bank, and then radiology and lab will be prioritized. So this patient came in as a level one trauma he was fairly stable, meaning we had time to take him to the CT scanner where we could take pictures from his head down to his pelvis. 
Now, I first want to go over a little bit of normal anatomy, and this is a picture of the cervical spine or the neck bones. I've drawn in some yellow lines to show you. We look for fairly smooth contours on each side of the bone, and then you can see where the spinal cord travels, and it's protected on either side by the bones. Now let me show you a picture of this patient's cervical spine. So it's pretty obvious that there's not a smooth contour where his neck bone should be traveling. And where that red arrow is, the patient had a fracture of that portion of his neck. And then you can see that the bone protrudes into the spinal canal and has injured his spinal cord. So this is a list of his injuries. He had the laceration over his forehead, and then he had the cervical spine or neck fracture. Unfortunately, the location where this patient had his spinal cord injury, where he had his fracture, this injured his spinal cord, and this resulted in him being a quadriplegic, where he's unable to move his uh, arms or his legs. So here's a summary of this patient's treatment in his hospital course. So he was in the hospital for a total of 42 days. 40 of those days were actually in the ICU. He required three different surgeries. The first surgery was to stabilize his neck, the bones in his neck. However, even with stabilizing those bones, the damage to the spinal cord had already been done and that does not improve the spinal cord function. He then required a tracheostomy, which is moving the breathing tube directly into his neck because the level at which the spinal cord was injured, he's no longer able to breathe on his own. And his third surgery involved a feeding tube. And that's because just like he'll never be able to breathe on his own again, he's never able to swallow or eat again on his own. So after over a month in the hospital, he was discharged to a long-term acute care hospital, which is where he will require 24 seven care for the rest of his life. Now in this patient, a seatbelt likely would have kept him in his seat and prevented him from flying forward, forward and hitting his forehead on the windshield. And that's what that starred windshield indicated. The significant amount of force that it took to propel him forward, uh, that force was then transmitted to his neck bones. And this is an example of how wearing a seatbelt could have prevented a life altering injury. And this was just one case example. You can imagine how the medical bills could pile up not only in the hospital, but also how medical bills could pile up long-term for medical care outside of the hospital itself. For non-fatal crash injuries, they've resulted in more than $48 billion in medical and work loss costs in a lifetime. In one year, fatal crashes and injuries result in $70 billion lost in medical and work loss costs. So I'm gonna move on to our second case example. So this is a 25 year old male who was a backseat passenger. He was wearing his seatbelt. The driver was traveling at over 120 miles an hour when he lost control and was involved in a rollover accident. When paramedics arrived at the scene, Again, there was significant damage to the vehicle itself, but the patient was found in the back seat, hanging upside down by his seatbelt. This patient also came in as a level one trauma. We were able to get pictures from his head all the way down to his pelvis. And thankfully for him, the only injuries he had were a mild cervical spine fracture, complained of being sore all over, and then a seatbelt sign, which you can see in the picture on the left. The amount of force that it takes for that seatbelt to hold you in your seat, it results in a big bruise and a fairly decent size abrasion. So this is a representative picture of this patient's injury. You need the arrow to see the injury here. It's a very subtle fracture uh, in the neck bone. So this patient did not require any ICU stays, but was only in the hospital for one day and then was discharged home wearing a neck brace for about three months. An interesting statistic here on the right, you can see that the CDC notes that Americans spend more than 1 million days in the hospital each year from crash injuries. So I wanted to talk about a little bit about a common concern that people have about wearing seatbelts. People are concerned that a seatbelt can trap you in a fire or underwater if you're involved in an accident. I would consider this a myth. While in reality, technically this could happen, in reality, incidents involving fire or water account for only 0.5 to 1% of all crashes. More importantly, you can't escape such dangers unless you're conscious, and seatbelts are going to give you a better chance of being conscious and able-bodied in order to escape these types of dangers.
So I have one more case example uh, for you. Now this is a 45 year old female. She was a passenger and was not wearing her seatbelt. She also was involved in a rollover accident, but because she was not wearing her seatbelt, she was ejected from the vehicle. When this patient came to the ER, it was obvious that she was too unstable to get pictures in the CT scanner. She was in obvious shock and had multiple life-threatening injuries and sites of bleeding. These are a list of her injuries. So in the body, there are five locations where large-scale bleeding can occur. This patient had bleeding from every single one of those sites. So the first site of large-scale bleeding can occur in the abdominal cavity. This patient had a ruptured spleen that required an emergency surgery to remove her spleen and stop the bleeding. The chest is the second portion of the body that can have significant bleeding. This patient had a collapsed lung as well as a bleeding lung that required a chest tube. The pelvis is another site of significant bleeding that can be difficult to control. The extremities or the femur and thigh bone are another area of large scale bleeding. The thigh can actually hold one to two liters of blood. And if there's not a cut on the outside, it can be deceiving how much bleeding is actually going on underneath the skin. And the fifth site of large scale bleeding can be the scalp. The scalp and the head are well vascularized and a large scalp laceration like this can result in a significant amount of blood loss that is often underappreciated. So this patient, between all of her surgeries, as well as being in the emergency department, she received 44 total units of blood products. That's 11 liters of blood. So she remained in the hospital for 15 days, required ICU stay for three days, and had four surgeries. She was discharged to an acute rehab unit for two weeks and then was able to go home. In this situation, a seatbelt would have kept her in her vehicle and potentially limited the number and severity of her injuries. Fortunately for this patient, all of her injuries were able to be fixed. Unfortunately, that is not the case if the brain is injured. And we'll move on next to talk about how you can protect your brain by wearing helmets. So we'll first start with bicycle helmets. Bicycle trips account for 1% of all walking and bicycling trips in the U.S. However, bicyclists face a much higher risk of crash-related injuries and deaths than motor vehicle crash occupants. In those patients who had reported injuries after a bicycle accident, one in eight bicyclists reported traumatic brain injuries. Helmets reduce the risk of head and brain injuries in the event of a bicycle crash. You would think that it'd be pretty obvious to wear your helmet every time. However, only 25% of all bicyclists actually wear their helmets regularly. In 2017, 54% of bicyclists were killed, who were killed were not wearing their helmets. This image here on the left is an appropriately fitted helmet on a child. The picture on the right is a real example of what a helmet looked like after a bicycle accident. Imagine the blow to the head taken without the protection of a helmet in that situation. Helmets can make a difference between a simple concussion and a severe brain injury or even death. The following have been shown to be promising interventions in reducing injury as well as fatality to bicyclists. First, it's active lighting and rider visibility. Wearing fluorescent and reflective clothing is helpful as are front white lights and rear red lights. Bike lanes and other roadway, roadway engineering has also been um, helpful in reducing injury and fatality to bicyclists. So here's our next case example. This was a 50 year old male who was riding his bicycle down a hill, was traveling about four, 15 miles an hour, but was not wearing his helmet. He lost control and hit a tree. Here's a picture of normal anatomy. So the bright white is the skull bones. And in the middle, you see the varying shades of gray. That's the brain matter itself. And here I draw a yellow line to show you that when looking at the brain, we're looking for uh, fairly symmetrical uh, sides on the right and on the left. This patient had multiple brain bleeds after he was evaluated in our emergency department, had several broken ribs, as well as a broken leg. Here is his CT scan of his head. So the arrows show, uh, show you some bright white, which is inside the brain itself, which is bleeding. And you can see there's definitely not symmetry in his brain. Because of the significant bleeding that he had, it caused edema and swelling of the brain. 
Now this patient required two days in the ICU, did not have any surgeries, but ultimately succumbed to his injuries and passed away. So that's one example. Let me talk, tell you about another example of a, a bicyclist. This was a 75-year-old male who was in the middle of a 30-mile bike ride when he was wearing his helmet, but he hit a pothole and flew over the handlebars. He has no recollection, recollection of the events and was found unconscious by bystanders. He had also a brain bleed, but the picture on the right shows uh, the very, very small punctate part of his uh, head bleed. So very small, nothing significant. Otherwise, his brain is fairly symmetrical. He also had a broken wrist as well as a broken collarbone. So this patient only stayed in the hospital for one day, did not require any ICU days, had no surgeries, and was discharged that next day with a brace for his uh, wrist and a sling for his collarbone. Now those two examples are uh, great examples of how helmets can make a huge difference between a simple or mild traumatic brain injury and a severe brain injury that results in death. So this slide here talks about a, um, a study published in the American Journal of Surgery in 2017. They evaluated over 6,000 patients. They found that only 25% of these patients were actually wearing a helmet, but those patients who were wearing a helmet, they had uh, reduced odds of severe traumatic brain injury. And this was reduced by over 50%. Those patients who were helmeted had a 44% reduced odds of death as well. So helmets protect against severe brain injury, but they also will save lives even after sustaining a brain injury because they decrease the severity of that injury. So bicycle helmets, they work when it matters most. All right, so I want to move on to motorcycle helmets now. So head injury is a common associated cause of death and long-term disability after a motorcycle collision. The United States could save over $1 billion in economic costs per year if all motorcyclists wore helmets. However, even with those two bullet points, there's still ongoing controversy about the survival and disability advantages for riders who wear motorcycle helmets. In 2016, over 1,800 lives were saved by wearing motorcycle helmets. We know that a universal helmet law is the single most effective way to save lives and save money. This chart here is a picture from the World Health Organization. Highlighted in green are the countries who have a national comprehensive helmet law as well as a helmet standard. But even with these countries who have national helmet laws, they indicate that only a third of these countries have good enforcement of these laws. So despite having the laws in place, these are difficult laws to enforce. In 2012, Michigan weakened their universal helmet requirement that required all drivers um, to wear a helmet. When this happened, Michigan noted that the percentage of non-helmeted crash fatalities quadrupled and there was a 14% increase in patients who were hospitalized with head injuries. Similarly, Florida in 2000, they repealed their all rider helmet law as well. Their fatalities increased by 21% and the deaths of riders who were under the age of 21 increased by 188%. So these riders who were under 21, the law did not apply to them, but when that universal all rider helmet law was repealed, um, they noted an increase in death of those younger patients as well. So wearing a motorcycle helmet, we know that it decreases the overall death rate after a motorcycle injury. It also decreases the incidence of lethal head injuries, and it decreases the severity of non-lethal head injuries when they do occur. So I want to talk a little bit about Missouri's helmet law. The all rider motorcycle helmet law was recently repealed back in July. Governor Mike Parson signed a bill into law that eased the helmet requirements for some motorcyclists. And this actually became effective August 28th, which was last Friday. And the new law allows riders over 26 years of age with proof of health insurance to opt out of using helmets. This is definitely disappointing because of the overwhelming evidence showing that safe, there are safety benefits of wearing motorcycle helmets. 
In 2018, states that did not have a universal helmet law had nine times as many unhelmeted fatalities. And like I talked about on the previous slides, it's difficult to enforce this type of law that is only age specific. Police are not able to pull over riders uh, just to check if they have proof of insurance or to check their age. Okay, so now I wanna move on to Stop the Bleed course. So this is an educational program. It represents the joint effort of many medical organizations. It represents the best practice recommendations for how to manage life-threatening bleeding. And typically this is a course that is in person where it's a lecture, uh, similar to the lecture that I'll be giving you today, but it also has some hands-on um, applications where you can practice packing and pressure and applying tourniquets. The in-person uh, tutorial is technically on hold because of the pandemic, but at the end of this presentation, I'll give you the website for Stop the Bleed that you can visit and you can review videos and you also can see some links in order to um, purchase any commercially available tourniquets if you'd like. So why is this important? Bleeding is the most common cause of preventable death after injury, and it must be stopped as soon as possible. There may be situations when there is a delay between the accident occurring and first responders being present at the scene. So without civilian intervention, preventable deaths could occur. The, this is the mission of the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma. They are the ones leading the effort to save lives by teaching civilians like you to stop uncontrolled bleeding in emergency situations. So where can you apply this? Many injury mechanisms can result in serious bleeding. There's a lot of media attention uh, with mass shootings or with the Boston Marathon bombings where tourniquets have been life-saving. However, it's more likely that these serious bleeding accidents are going to occur closer to you. So at home, at work, um, or on the road. So the techniques taught in this Stop the Bleed course will be applied to any bleeding in any location. So the goals of the Stop the Bleed course are first to identify and recognize any life-threatening bleeding and then intervening and figuring out how to stop the bleeding with pressure, packing, or with tourniquets. So personal safety is your first priority. Only help others when it's safe for you. And if the situation ever changes or becomes unsafe, stop, move to safety, and if you can, take the victim with you. Anytime we're dealing with blood or bodily fluids, your safety is first. Wear gloves if you can. And if your body comes in contact with any part of, with anyone else's blood, make sure you clean your part of the body and tell a healthcare provider if you get blood on you. So the ABCs of bleeding control are listed here. For A, you're going to alert 911. B, will identify the bleeding. And C, will compress and treat the bleeding. So A, alert 911. If you identify life-threatening bleeding or any accident where help is needed, call 911, know your location, and then follow the instructions provided by the 911 operator. Next, look for the source of bleeding. Large volume bleeding is going to be continuous bleeding. Sometimes it's pulsatile, which means it's spurting like a sprinkler. It can be pooling of blood, and it could be um, bleeding that's covered by clothing. So we, sometimes you have to search for it. And there may be multiple sites of bleeding. Clothing, like I said, can hide any life-threatening bleeding. So as much as possible, remove any bulky clothing, tear the pant legs, tear the arms of a shirt uh, to identify these locations of bleeding. So this course is going to teach you how to stop external bleeding. The extremities are going to be a common site of bleeding, so the arms or legs, which are highlighted here in blue. The junctional areas, which are the neck, armpit, and groin, are also sites of large volume blood loss, and that's because large blood vessels run through these locations. Tourniquets aren't applicable if there's bleeding from these locations, but pressure and packing would be helpful. If there's ever bleeding from the trunk or the body highlighted there in red, that's considered internal bleeding. That's not something that can be controlled at the scene. So that's a patient who needs to be rapidly transported to a hospital or a trauma center. 
So the first tenet of bleeding control is pressure. So you're gonna localize the site of bleeding and apply direct pressure, focusing on the location. You want to use a small amount of gauze or cloth, and less is actually more in this situation. If you use too much cloth or too much gauze, it can make the pressure ineffective. If the pressure stops the bleeding, then keep the pressure in place until help arrives. Sometimes simple pressure isn't adequate. So if you see the figure um, on the right, figure B, you see a deep wound. If you're just packing, or if you're just put, uh, putting pressure on top of the wound, you can see that blood can pool deep down in the tissues and the actual pressure is ineffective. So for large deep wounds, you need to pack gauze or cloth tightly and deep down into the wound until bleeding stops. So if pressure doesn't help, if packing doesn't help, um, and you see an extremity wound, a tourniquet would be the next uh, step. A tourniquet you can see is on the right. Ideally, you place it two to three inches above the wound itself. Do not place it over the elbow or knee joints, and then tighten it until the bleeding stops. Tourniquets hurt, and they will hurt if they're working. And once it's in place, do not remove it. Now you can apply a tourniquet to someone else, but you could also apply a tourniquet to yourself. You can apply it over light clothing, but if there's ever any bulky clothing in place, such as a jacket, this should be removed before the tourniquet is placed. Um, if you are placing a tourniquet over a pocket, make sure that you empty the pocket, otherwise the tourniquet may be ineffective. And like I said, tourniquets hurt, so expect that if you're applying a tourniquet. Sometimes a second tourniquet is required. If a second tourniquet is placed, place it above the first, which means place it closer to the torso. And these are some pictures of some commercially available tourniquets. Um, Improvised tourniquets are something people ask about frequently, and I'll talk about that at the end. Improvised tourniquets are not recommended as they're often uh, applied incorrectly and they, are, they can actually make bleeding worse. The bleeding control in children is very similar to the techniques in adults. So you can use the same tourniquet in all except for the extremely young child. And if you have an infant or a very small child where the tourniquet is too big, direct pressure on the wound will actually, uh, will usually suffice. And then wound packing is the same in both adults as in children. Okay, so some frequently asked questions about um, bleeding. So what if you have a patient that has an impaled object? Should you remove it? Definitely no. Leave an impaled object in place because if you remove it, you might start bleeding that the impaled object itself had been tamponading or, or keeping under control. So leave that impaled object in place. If you can, and there's bleeding around the object, then place a tourniquet above the object itself. What about improvised tourniquets? Like I said, they're not scientifically proven. They're difficult to form, they're difficult to apply, and they often make bleeding worse because what they'll do is they'll compress the vein, uh, but they will not actually compress the artery or what is providing, causing the pulsatile flow. So if you have a commercially available tourniquet, that is going to be uh, the recommendation. What about the loss of an arm or a leg? People are often concerned, if I apply a tourniquet, I'm gonna to cause the victim to lose an extremity. Um, Life-threatening bleeding is something that is going to outweigh any risk of losing a limb. If you have a tourniquet and there is lar large volume bleeding, place a tourniquet um, and medical professionals will determine whether this needs to be in place or whether it needs to be left in place any longer. And what about pain? Like I said multiple times, placing a tourniquet hurts, so expect pain, um, even with packing and pressure. The patient already has a wound, and now you're applying a significant amount of force to stop the bleeding, so it's going to hurt. So in summary, when you're um, encountering life-threatening bleeding, make sure you take into account your personal safety first. Alert 911, find the bleeding, and then compress it first with pressure or packing. And if that isn't sufficient, then compress it with a tourniquet and wait for help to arrive. We talked about how seat belts save lives and they reduce serious injuries. So buckle up every time. Also, bicycle helmets. We know it protects against severe brain injury and it also saves, li saves lives. So keep this image of this helmet uh, in your mind next time you're riding your own bike.
And finally, motorcycle helmets. Similarly, the universal helmet law is the single most effective way to save lives. So please, if you're wearing a motorcycle, if you're riding a motorcycle, wear your helmet. And this is the website I was talking about, stopthebleed.org. Visit that to review any pictures to uh, show, to see how you apply a tourniquet, how you can apply pressure and packing. And then also there are links to commercially available tourniquets. Okay, thank you everybody. We'll open, that, um, open it up to questions now. Thank you very much, Dr. Holly. That was a great presentation. I just want to remind everyone that if you have a question, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and type in the question. So the first question is, roadway engineering is a promising intervention in your presentation. North Kansas City is holding a special meeting this month to discuss the Armour Road complete street do you believe the project has improved safety for uh, pedestrians and cyclists on Armour Road? You know, they've created that bike lane along Armour Road and they've reduced uh, portions of Armour Road down to uh, one lane. And there's some discussion in the city whether that's a, a good thing for the cyclists and a bad thing for the uh, motorists. Uh, so let's just take a broad question. Uh, are bike lanes helpful? It, I think bike lanes are helpful because it keeps a bicyclist separate from a vehicle lane. And that's what's important is keeping that distance between the cyclist and a vehicle and having a separate lane for bicyclists. I think it makes uh, drivers of vehicles more aware um, and more alert to bicyclists that may be around them. That's great. Uh, here's a question from the crowd. Uh, what is the risk of to front seat drivers when back seat drivers don't wear their seat belts? Have you had any uh, cases where you've seen people in the front seat obey the seat belt laws, but people in the back seat don't? And what's the impact uh, to all the occupants of the car? So anybody who is not restrained in their seat basically is a projectile or a foreign body that could injure people other people in the car. So even though a front seat driver is restrained, the person behind them could propel forward and cause an injury from behind. Um, so I think it's definitely important for all passengers and all in, and the driver to wear their seatbelt. That's great advice. Um, here's another question. If a car has airbags, uh, why does a driver or a passenger need to wear a seatbelt? So I touched on this earlier, uh, an airbag does provide added protection. However, it's not, uh, it's not going to keep a person in the seat. And that's the key is keeping you in your seat um, in the event of an accident, because your body is going to propel forward at the same speed that the car was traveling. Whereas the car stops, your body will continue to propel forward. And so the seat belt is what you need to keep you in your seat. Here's another great question from the audience and one that I've thought about often as I drive down the road. If someone stops to help an injured person on the road and your help makes the injury worse, can the victim sue you? And I, I'm going to ask you in two ways. Okay. One, I would ask you as a doctor if you stop to help. And then what happens if you're just a non-medical person who's just a good Samaritan? Uh, what are the implications of stopping to help someone? I don't know the legal implications, um, but I, with a good Samaritan law, I think if you stop and you have that person's best interests at heart, do what you can and do what you feel um, is in your ability to help with them. As a physician, same thing. I I am used to treating patients in the hospital, in the ER. So if I saw someone on the side of the road at the scene, that might be out of the scope of my practice, honestly. So I'm going to do what I'm comfortable doing and allow paramedics and first responders to get there and help as well. And from your lecture, you, the first thing that you had mentioned was to call 911. Mm -hmm. So getting help, getting uh, the local first responders there, they have the equipment and the authority. So great question. So here's another question from the audience. When I'm driving slow around the city, do I really need to wear a motorcycle helmet? Isn't the most important use of a motorcycle helmet is when I'm on the highway. 
So I'd say that's a good question. However, even driving slowly, um, if you fall off a motorcycle, you could still hit your head and cause a traumatic brain injury. So regardless of the speed that you're going, a helmet is important. Um, just think about a, a bicycle. You're not traveling at the high rate of speeds that a motorcycle would be. Um, so having a helmet on every time is important. And even if you're driving slowly, it's not always you um, that you're concerned about. It's other vehicles. What if a vehicle didn't see you and you were hit by another vehicle um, and were involved in an accident um, in that re for that reason? So I think wearing a motorcycle helmet, regardless of how fast you're going, should be worn every time. Plus, it establishes good habits. If you wear it all the time, um, you know, there's no question whenever you get on your motorcycle what you're going to do. Okay. Uh, another listener asked this question, just wanted some clarification. You spoke about using tourniquets under the Stop the Bleed presentation. How long should someone leave a tourniquet on? So if you place a tourniquet, leave it on. Let the medical professionals be the ones to take it down and further evaluate the wound. If you put a tourniquet on and it stops bleeding, you've done your job. Um, whenever the person arrives to the emergency department, we'll look at it and we leave it on as little um, as short of a time as possible. Um, but once you put it on, leave it on. Okay. Another listener asked about motorcycle helmets and wanted to know what type of helmet was the best one to wear? A half helmet, a three quarters helmet, uh, a full face helmet, uh, a dual sport helmet. What, what in your opinion is the best motorcycle helmet to wear? A full face helmet for sure. Um, we often see people come in with the half helmets or the skull helmets. Um, those aren't as adequate at protecting the skull, the face, and the brain. Um, and I didn't mention that motorcycle helmets, um, they also will decrease the incidence of facial fractures if you're wearing a full face helmet. Well, that's great. So can someone use a bicycle helmet after it has been involved in a crash? The recommendation is to get a new helmet after uh, you're involved in any kind of accident, even if it seems minor. Um, the force that it took if you're involved in an accident could have damaged the helmet in some way. So if you're involved in a crash, the recommendation is to get a new bike helmet. That was a very compelling slide that you showed of the backseat passenger whose car flipped at 120 miles an hour and he had that um, seatbelt mark. So we have a question from the audience. Can a seatbelt cause harm or injury if it is not worn properly? Yes, it can, and that's a very good question. So I showed you the pictures of the appropriately positioned lap belt, so over the, the lap in the pelvis, and as well as over the uh, chest wall. So if that lap belt is not over the bony pelvis and is actually up more on the abdomen, um, severe internal injury can occur. Um, and the most common uh, cause is bruising uh, to the muscles of the abdominal wall and tearing of those muscles, um, but also the force that a patient will have when they fly forward uh, during an accident will compress anything that's between the seatbelt and the spine. The most common organs that are in between there are the intestine. Um, so people can injure their intestine, rupture them, and that itself um, might require an additional surgery. So if lap belts aren't positioned properly over the pelvis, uh, they can cause internal damage. Here's a question, must be from a young mom. When should I replace my child's bike helmet? Can you talk about fit, chin straps, sizing, those kinds of things? Sure, so I would have to defer you to follow the instructions and make sure you have an appropriately sized helmet for your child and your child's age. Um, and similarly, if your child falls and is involved in an accident, if there's a crack um, or probably even a scuff, if they had a significant fall, I would recommend uh, buying a new helmet. And make sure you're following the uh, recommendations and guidelines for that size helmet um, and upsizing when it's appropriate. Great. Uh, another listener asked, when faced with the need to stop bleeding out in the field, how do I protect myself from bloodborne illnesses since I likely will not have gloves with me at the time of the accident? Uh, so definitely if you have any open wounds on your hand, I would not recommend touching any bodily fluids or blood. Um, but if you have 
gloves or someone else has gloves, that's ideal. You can use cloth to, pro to provide protection between the blood and your skin. Um, also important is other protective um, measures. So if you have glasses or sunglasses, that can protect your eyes. Um, and now everybody's wearing a face mask and has a mask, so that's going to be something else that can protect your, your nose and your mouth as well. That's great. Well, thank you very much. Well, I don't see any more questions from the audience. I, I personally want to thank Dr. Holly for joining us today. She's one of our stars here at North Kansas City Hospital and someone who I personally have worked with. She provides excellent care to all of our surgery patients and more particularly to our trauma patients. We all hope that you've gained some useful information on the ways you can prevent traumatic injuries and help in an emergency situation. Should you ever need life-saving care from a traumatic injury, North Kent City Hospital is a level two, level two trauma center and we're uh, re at the ready to help you. This means that our critical team has the resources and the equipment to care for the most severe injuries. To find out more, please go to our website at northkentcityhospital.org. That's N-K-C-H dot org forward slash trauma. Thank you very much for attending and we look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you.